I'm Jason. I uh, I work for Fivecast. We're a we're a startup. We're a tech startup based right here in Adelaide. Um, in fact, if there weren't the curtains here, I could probably see my office from here. Um, and we also have an established presence in the U.S. So, you know, as a company, you know, our focus is on providing world-leading digital intelligence solutions. And right now, our tools are helping some of the world's most important public and private organizations explore you know, masses of data, um, uncover actionable insights, and uh, and protect global communities. Now, today, I'm talking about OSINT for understanding influence operations. So, you know, that's Open source intelligence, um, which for those unfamiliar, it simply put, it's any intel that we can gather from the open internet. So it's social media, deep web, dark web, etc. And over the next, uh, over, over the course of this talk, I'll talk a bit about the importance of understanding online narratives, including how adversarial entities may attempt to manipulate them via influence operations. I'll talk about the challenges inherent in using data from the surface, the deep, the dark web to monitor and analyze these online conversations. And we'll, we'll finish with some of the application of advanced OSINT technology for understanding influence operations. Now I've said influence here, but you know, let's get a grip on like, what's being influenced. And uh, what I mean is we're influencing public opinion Here's some examples of public opinion. Um, like when you when you view public opinion, especially online, you can you can think of it kind of as a you know, it's an emergent property of all the online collective conversations and media campaigns occurring at any one point. So as such, it can be messy, it can be contradictory, it can you know it can even be unsettling. Uh, you know, and the fun thing is that it's susceptible to social influence. And this is particularly as a response to the perceived behaviors of others um, and especially you know, perceived peers. And I'm, I'm, I'm using the word perceived here because you know, we're, we're online. It's often unclear when the actions and opinions that we witness are genuine and when they're a manipulation. But you know, however we take this, under the right conditions, the type of, this type of influence is powerful enough to turn the tide of public opinion. And uh, yeah, so this brings us onto, onto influence operations. This is a pretty standard, I think, uh, definition of an influence operation. So yeah, it's a coordinated campaign to impact one or more specific aspects of politics or public consensus through media channels, including social media, by producing content designed to appear indigenous to the target audience. And uh, yeah, I'd just like to draw attention to the first point there, the, the coordination. This, to um, you know, in 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 my, in my mind, it's probably the biggest thing of of the of the four. Uh, a term that you you may see bandied about in relation to influence operations is uh, coordinated inauthentic behaviour. Um, and the, the the point is that when you've got evidence of coordinated behaviors, particularly inauthentic ones, and you know, this inauthenticity, that uh, that fourth point there, this uh, this deception to, to to make your make your message seem more indigenous, that's a, that's you know, an inauthentic behavior. But evidence of this coordination can help really differentiate between what is an influence operation and what's some genuine what's a genuine movement. So getting on to the propagation of the, of, of dangerous content. There are there are three broad categories that we we see talks about. On the left, we have uh, perhaps the most benign. It's uh, yeah, it's not not, not super benign. It, it does pollute the conversation, nonetheless. Uh, it's misinformation. So this is misleading. This is wrong, but posted in good faith. The the people involved in this, we would we would say that they're unwitting actors, unwitting proxies. Moving on, more insidious, is disinformation. So like misinformation, this is misleading info. But in this case, we're talking about primary actors and we're talking about witting proxies who are knowingly lying. And finally, we have malinformation, which uh, in some ways is a misnomer. It's not really information at all. It's trolling and it's abuse. Now, whatever form the dangerous content takes, it can damage a target if you know, traction is gained beyond the influence operation itself. 
On this slide, we're just looking at a few trends in, uh, in influence operations. Uh, like the, the, there's a few research groups studying this. There's quite a lot of research groups studying this. And uh, you, you, you get you know, similar trends coming up. So year on year, number of influence operations, they're increasing. Um, this uh, plot on the left, it, you know, the, 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 the descent in 2018 and 19, that's just a delay in, uh, that's an artifact of uh, reporting delays. Uh, whereas the, the one on the right, that's, uh, that's from a Facebook report and uh, they're using their own data. You can see it's, uh, it, it's, it's much more clear that it's still increasing in terms of, con um, in, in terms of number. Something else that we see is that uh, Russia, uh, to pick on Russia again, via their internet research agency has been and remains the biggest player out there. But again, looking at this, uh, this world map here, we can see that it's becoming more of a global sport. And finally, we often talk about foreign influence operations, but in reality, you get a similar rate of foreign and domestic influence operations. And by domestic, I mean, that's the state operating against its own people. Now, this is, this is a pretty pertinent uh, quote. So a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Um, sometimes uh, attributed to Mark Twain, which is ironic since it's not from Mark Twain. Sometimes Winston Churchill, also a misattribution. Um, I think it's Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, but don't quote me on that because uh, it's actually pretty unclear. Anyway, whatever, whoever said it, and I've just said it, um, it's a fitting description of how the diffusion of news stories and you know, particularly fake news um, goes over uh, social media. Um, there was a fairly recent MIT study which looked at well, they compared bots and they compared humans and and how they they work to to propagate like, truth and fiction across the across the internet. Uh, a little surprising. Bots were pretty even-handed, whereas humans, possibly latching onto novelty, latching onto scandal, were far more. Um, they, they disseminated uh, fake news at a far higher rate. First within echo chambers and then into the wider community. Now, here we have a diagram to capture the spirit of this uh, diffusion and amplification of, well, if it goes through the whole thing, that's a successful inf influence operation. We will start with at the content creation. Um, we tend to see here a lot of recycling and a lot of plagiarism. This is obviously, you know, it saves time, it saves resources, but what, you're also getting, especially from the plagiarism, is uh, messaging which can look much more indigenous. It can um, it can hide your own lack of you know, ability in in mimicking um, your your target audience by just taking their messages from them. And then this content is shared across social media. Now, most influence operations they kind of fail here. They just add noise to the online discourse. They don't really get very far into this. But those that do, uh, they, they have a tendency to, you know, the messages start bouncing around. Um, they get honed, they get refined within, within echo chambers, within you know, sometimes called nests, um, before breaking out, uh, breaking out into the, the wider social media world. And then when, when, when you've got that far, the likelihood increase is that you'll get you know, an influencer or uh, some accepted mainstream online community or even the print media uh, picking up the conversation. And at this point, you'd say that you, you've, got, you've got some good traction in, in this campaign. So when you've got a big enough or a, indeed a lucky enough push, then we can see yeah, influence operations spilling out into the real world. And sometimes, um, as you know, famously happened in, in, in the United States back in January with the Capitol riots, there can be dire consequences. Now, uh, bots. Bots is a thing that we talk about. And historically, uh, bots, which um, I'm saying are automated accounts, and, uh, and trolls, which are people acting anonymously have been very effective at amplifying messages and 
um, helping campaigns go viral. Now, uh, they've been, like, they, they are, they are very common. Like the, the influence operations database, they, they have uh, detected bots in about half of all of their operations. Um, and in the 2016 US presidential elections, it's documented that bots reached a position of measurable influence. However, the, the fallout from that particular operation was so strong that it has resulted in a widespread heightened awareness of that threat to the point where, here we are. So in targeting the 2020 election, Russia links covert accounts did not achieve any significant traction with the targeted communities. So while we had um, Russian botnets and Russian troll farms active in both 2016 and 2020, in the former, uh, we'd say that they were important players, but come the latter, no, not so much. And in fact, in 2020, the real like, super spreaders, as it were, of disinformation were verified accounts. So influencers who made no attempt to disguise their identities, while where we did see um, bot and troll activity gaining success, it tended to be restricted to nascent and marginal campaigns. Now, uh, I'm going to spend the rest of this now talking about some of the tools that, that we can use. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll start with why, why, why would we use OSINT over just having analysts sitting at computers searching the internet on their own? So first of all, it gives us flexibility. Now, we're saying that social media is a useful proxy for, for real-time public opinion. Um, and OSINT gives us the flexibility to ask and refine complex questions even once an investigation is underway. It lets us follow specific actors or groups of interest. It lets us track trends. Uh, this, this flexibility, this uh, specificity, this ability to track, it differs a little from you know, what, we, what we would have in you know, the traditional methods for measuring public opinion. These are, these are things like polls, sample surveys, focus groups. Um, so you know, now we can, you know, we're not just looking at demographics, we're not just looking at uh, things where you're defining the question up front and you've, you've possibly got some delays. With, with OSINT, you can, you can do real-time real -time analysis. Now, of course, there are downsides and it's not a like-for-like -like replacement for, for, for what's come before, but in situations which are fast moving, which are you know, like influence operations, it's the right tool for the job. OSINT also gives us scalability. Now, I don't think it's controversial to say that there's a huge amount of mainly unstructured data that we'd need to sift through. It's messy. There are overlapping conversations, sometimes going cross-platform, heterogeneous messages, and an ever-changing social media landscape. Now, on this point of heterogeneous messages, depending on what you're, um, what you're trying to do, a valid message can be it can be anything from a structured essay, something like a manifesto, uh, a video, an image, um, just some short piece of text or a simple reply, a meme, an emoji, uh, you know, thumbs up, a like, like anything in between. So with OSINT, we get, you know, OSINT gives us some smart automated solutions, which can really help analysts follow topics, follow conversations and uh, interrogate networks. Now here's an example of some of the things that you can do content analysis wise. Uh, and uh, yeah, just, just, just going through here, down at the bottom, we can see we can do text, text analysis, some, you know, some NLP, uh, pulling up things like sentiment and emotion, um, looking, at, uh, looking at topics. So are people talking about things that we're interested in? Uh, beyond beyond the text, there's there's images. Images are uh, also very important, and uh, image analysis is it's it's a pretty mature field. So you know, we can see that you can detect a tank in there. You can detect guns in the other one. Um, in that picture of the tank, there's also some uh, some text embedded in the image, and you can use things like uh, like OCR to to bring those out and then analyze them as text. And it's all yeah, you know, it's it's. Uh, all of this has been really driven by driven by what we are calling deep learning or AI, and it's uh, it's it's come a long way. With content analysis, uh, you can 
you can then start thinking about trend analysis. Yep. Uh, it lets you track behavior. It lets you lets you get a, a much more nuanced uh, nuanced feel for you know, how the behavior of individuals and groups change over time. Uh, I've shown sentiment and emotion up here, but you know, anything that you can measure, you can do a trend analysis for. So it's engagement with topics, um, change in the degree of your level of influence within a network. Uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's really, really anything that you can think of. And then we come on to network analysis. So this is great for looking at both behavior and coordination. Once you've got your data represented like this, you, you've got the power to start looking at information flows. Uh, you can say, you know, you can ask who are the influencers. Um, depending on what kind of model you're using, you can do some really nuanced things like uh, looking at the network. Where, where are the pinch points? Where, who, who should I be targeting in order to disrupt, to best disrupt this influence operation? All right, so that's... Uh, that, that, that's some techniques. Um, there's a whole bunch of open source solutions for anyone interested in this. That first one, it's pronounced awesome. I disagree with the pronunciation, but it's just how it is. Uh, they have lots of really good tools. And the two that I've shown up there, Botometer and Hoaxy, um, great Twitter and analytic tools. The first one, it's a, it's a bot detector. And the second one, it's a really nice, really nice visualization for um, looking at information flows over Twitter. So seeing how messages propagate. Below that, I've got um, the, the DFR lab, the digital, digital forensics research lab. Again, fantastic resource. They've got lots of stuff in, in, this, in this space. Um, I'm highlighting the, the foreign influence attributes tracker. It's, uh, it's a widget. And then below that, we have something for the, for the data scientists. It's NLP libraries. All right, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's me talking about Austin. Um, I'd like to just finish by saying that I've talked about technical stuff and you, you, you can't think that the technical stuff is the solution in and of itself. Uh, there, there are lots of other things that you need to consider here. So expert intel, that's still a very important part. Education, so making users more savvy, making them more resilient to, uh, to, to you know, these campaigns. Um, and then also deterrence. So um, platforms banning, um, maybe some policy things. All right, so in sum, I am over time here, but there are, there are great tools out there. There are great tools being developed and yeah, we can, we can, we can use them to, to, to great effects, but just remember that tools on their own won't fix the problem. So thank you. Open the floor for questions. Ms. Jessica. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Jessica Borges from the University of Adelaide. So I'm a civil engineer, so a little bit from a different industry. But I guess um, my question is the idea behind understanding these networks and understanding how these bots and fake news and all of that propagate is to analyze past um occurrences of that or like to look at how to stop them in the future and if it is how to stop them in the future i guess my question is how do you do that like if you just you can understand and you see how the that misinformation is flowing in twitter or whatever how do you stop it like i just curious about how do you do that all right so thank, thanks for that question jessica um short short answer is it's like you, right now you can't like there's it's, it's very difficult to stop it um there are definitely steps being taken by the social media platforms. Um, Facebook re released their, their, their threat intel report um, just over a month ago now. Some steps that they're taking, which uh, like, they look quite encouraging, is uh, um, taking an adversarial approach. So they, they have their own, it's, it's, they've got a red team that uh, will try to um, push influence operations as you know as they think that they might be able to exploit it and it's up to that it's up to you know, the blue team to build guards against that um, there are there, there are some more abstract models of how these um, influence operations grow I know there's a there's work from George Washington University where they they model it in a, they model it as a 
as a kind of bubble forming process. So it's something that they call gelation, where uh, well, what they what they hypothesized there was that you can um, go into an if you've got a good view of the network, uh, you can pick people like not the not necessarily the the the, the big guys. It's like you you take you take like ten percent of the the group at random and you you ban them or you shadow ban them, and they are. Uh, and they can no longer contribute, and you you, you control you can you, you really control the um, the rates at which these things can can expand. So yeah, there are there are lots of there are lots of ways of, of attacking it, but uh, obviously right now there's no you know, there's, there's no perfect solution.